Thank you, Sherilyn. And thank you for being here. And I do want to give a shout out. I believe there's a whole salon contingent in the audience. <laughs> That's awesome. You have fans. I have, I have, I have friends and, and my colleagues with whom I, alongside whom I launched my career and did some of my very proudest years of journalism. I love you guys. Oh, oh. See, we're going to be crying all night. No, we're going to be laughing all night through our tears and rage. Um, Okay, so let's get this started. Rebecca, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Um, you started writing this book, Good and Mad, in March or so, just after Trump was elected, maybe just after he was inaugurated. And you wrote it in a fury <laughs> between February and June um, of 2018. So there's, there's a little bit of a delay cycle between deciding to write the book and then actually just jamming on it. Is that about right? It's about, yes, that's about right. Okay. It was that when I first thought that I was going to write this book and got a contract to write it, I assumed I was going to write it over, through, over the Trump administration, over a few years, and publish it maybe in 2020, and that it was going to be something um, where I looked back at the history and examined um, how women's anger had played out within a Trump administration, but it was going to be sort of considered and take a long time. And then by the time that we got... And, and I'd made this decision and decided to write this book in, in January, which is bef before the Women's March, before the travel ban protests and the protests at the airport, before the historic number of women decided to run for office, um, before the kind of activism that uh, applied pressure that ended with Republicans deciding not to repeal the ACA, um, before the teacher strikes, before, <laughs> and there was a certain point um, when Me Too a year ago, the hashtag Me Too um, period of months where it was at its most intense, that I was like, I have to write this book quickly. I can't. I'm not doing it over a few years. I don't want to. I don't want to lose how intense and wild this fury feels. And so I decided to write it quickly. And I had. I took time off, and I from my day job at New York Magazine, and I wrote it between February and June first. I handed it in June first. Well, my question was, and and you sort of recap this, but did you feel like we were at peak fury? So you you like you had to get on it quickly before like we lost all that anger at that time. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I would say that one of the great lessons of the past uh, couple of years is that there is no peak fury. <laughs> that <laughs> right now, that every time we think it's peak fury, and actually the, the journalist and podcast host this morning, I have to credit her with saying this, Erin <laughs> Ryan said to me this morning during a podcast, she was like, every time I thought it was as intense as it was going to get, and like, this was the worst week ever, the next week comes along and is like, hold my beer. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's very true. So in the time since I handed it in in June, um, and of course during the months I was writing it, when the teacher strikes were really I mean, spreading in states where, t where striking is illegal. These wildcat strikes and, and um, you know, mostly women strikers were extracting deals from their state governments for higher wages, higher pay. Um, I was like, oh my God, I wish the book were out right now. And then I handed it in and it was being edited very quickly. Um, there are typos, I'm really sorry. Um, and there was, the, there were the immigration policy protests and women in foil blankets in the Hart office building of the Senate and Maxine Waters encouraging protest and, and public gathering and then being rebuked by members of her own party um, for being uncivil about which I was completely fucking livid. And uh, I was like, oh my God, I wish the book were out now. Um, and then there was Les Moonves. I was like, I wish the book were out now. And then the book came out, uh, like f five days after the Kavanaugh testimony. Yeah, and I, I had, I actually had the book in my hand, I don't know, maybe a month before the Kavanaugh hearings. And once you read this book, everything changes. There's a whole other filter that you start to put on the things that you see around you in the way that women are perceived for getting angry, 
for not getting angry, for men for getting angry, and the way, the way that the world looks has totally shifted <laughs> since I read this book. And I, and I imagine that for, for those of you who do read it, you will, and maybe even after the end of this conversation, you'll also have that same experience because it just started to create a, a framework for what we were seeing. It, I'm glad that I'm really, it's lovely to hear that because I intended it to be a tool, right? Not knowing that it was going to come out in the midst of what, turned out to be this horrific um, news cycle that's not just a news cycle, it's now the rest of our lives. Um, and our children's lives. And, and our children's lives, them. right. Um, but I intend, the reason I wanted to write it quickly is because I felt like I, for myself, having thought about anger suddenly as the framework that connected a lot of the writing I'd been doing, a lot of the history that I'd studied, I thought that it could be a tool for so many women who were feeling all of this stuff that were discouraged from expressing to put it in some historical and political context about like that anger, that thing you're feeling that's making your brain boil, um, that may be driving you to protest or to run for office or to strike or to knock doors. This has a history. It is politically consequential. And there are a lot of forces out there that are going to tell you that it's it makes you ugly and unattractive and emotion, you know, you sound too emotional to be believed and why are you acting like this? You're so crazy and you're, you've totally changed. And I wanted it to be a tool um, for women to better be able to contextualize the thing that they're feeling and experiencing within American history. Um, but I, what people ha who've read it, it al also does offer, I think, a filter for what we've just heard to, you know, it, and I didn't know that that was going to be a function that it had. Yeah, it really makes sense of things. Actually, I'm just going to show people. This is, this is the nice new copy right here. And this right here is my copy. Every single page is earmarked, and there's notes on all of them. <laughs> so actually, I'd, I'd love to have you read from part of your book. That it, it, It's a section. It's towards, I don't know, maybe the last third of the book that I think does an excellent job of summing up um, this idea of the chaos that we are starting to create and the control that our patriarchy would like to exert. Um, so could I have you read that section? Sure. Um, and it is, it's about the notion that when women get angry and voice it, the world becomes disrupted and chaotic. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chaos. Chaos was what former Senator Barbara Mikulski had remembered in 1991 when the women of the House had banged on the door and insisted that Senate leader George Mitchell, Mitchell talk to them about letting Anita Hill testify against Clarence Thomas. There was a sense that the whole process, if not spinning out of control, was getting very chaotic, Mikulski remembered of that day in an oral history in which Hill recalled that Senator Mitchell's approach had been, let's keep things under control, under his control. The women's insistence that they get to talk, that they got to insist that Hill get to tell her story, was the moment that George Mitchell, Mitchell lost control. Yes, things were out of control. This is actually a section where I'm writing about Me Too, the hashtag Me Too movement last fall. Yes, things were out of control. That was the point. Because control was when no one was able to report the story of Harvey Weinstein raping women. Control was Donald Trump getting elected president thanks to voter suppression and the electoral college system de designed to suppress and thus better control non-white populations. Control was the unchallenged reigns of Bill O'Reilly and Roger Ailes and Bill Cosby. Control was women being too terrified to defy Eric Schneiderman by telling of how he hit them. Control was ensuring that no one cared about the abuses sustained by Ford factory employees or flight attendants. Control was all male presidents and vice presidents. Control was only two black women senators and no black women governors in the history of the country. Control was marital rape being legal to the 70s. Control was slavery and locking women in unsafe shirtwaist factories. Control was Jordan Peterson's Taoist white serpent thrust at us against our will. And women, ordinary women, understood this. The pollster Tressa Undum carefully tracking Americans' attitudes about gender, told me in 2017 that her polling had shown a huge majority of voters, 86%, who connected the notions of harassment and assault to a, quote, desire for power and control over women. Undum told me that she'd also seen a very sudden and striking shift after years of polling on reproductive rights. For the first time, 
she had begun to hear voters use the words control and controlling women when discussing efforts to restrict women's access to abortion and to contraception. To some extent, women who wanted liberty and equality knew they had to create some chaos. And yes, it was moving with such velocity and intensity that it was terrifying in its unpredictability. But it had to be radical and wrathful and energetic to get people to pay attention and to actually alter the power dynamics. Rules had to be changed, as they had been in the second wave, when marriages entered into on unequal terms were no longer acceptable, and the fact that some of them ended was a sudden shock to the system, and some men, some men felt they had been unfairly victimized by swiftly changing expectations. Now, butt groping and salacious come-ons and harassment were no longer going to be acceptable, and some men were going to lose their jobs, and some of them would no doubt feel that they had been unfairly victimized. But this was what it meant to say that we wanted the world to be different, not in some hazy future after all the old, not different men had retired from their perches and died peacefully in their sleep. We wanted it to be different now, and that meant dethroning some of them early. Things had to get out of control. The law cannot do it for us, Shirley Chisholm had said. We must do it for ourselves. Women in this country must become revolutionaries. Thank you. See what I mean? So I, I do want to acknowledge we do have men in the audience, and I really want to thank you for being here and being our allies. <laughs> And I, I don't think that this, this women's anger is about hating men. I mean, I think we no. just need to be super clear about that because some people might not understand that. Right. No, it's <laughs> not at all. I mean, I write a lot in the book about how one of the reasons that it's so hard, you know, mass women's movements. I, the book is about women's anger about all kinds of injustice and inequity. It's women's anger at unjust and unsafe working conditions and low wages and economic inequality. It's women's anger about racism and, and racist violence. Um, and one of the things I write about in the book is that one of the hardest inequities to form mass movements around is gender, or, or gender inequity. And in part, that is because of the nature of structural sexism and misogyny. Women are an oppressed majority. And what that means is that every woman has men in her life and every man has women in his life. And so in, it, in the moments that you're gonna challenge the power dynamics, that means challenging and disrupting some of the most intimate relationships in our lives familial relationships with fathers and brothers and sons, romantic and sexual relationships, heterosexual relationships, um, relationships between friends, dependency relationships. Women are often dependent on men economically in their workplaces and within marriages. And very often, I, coming to mass consciousness about unequal gender dynamics and power abuses means acknowledging that some of the bad guys are our good guys. There are men that we love and that we need. And the disruption of some of those most intimate relationships is incredibly difficult emotionally. And it's very, this is a process that's incredibly hard to do because it involves that kind of intimate um, set of changes and a, lot of, and a lot of personal pain. And it's one of the reasons that I think we go 50 and 60 years between mass women's movements because that pain can mean, there's, there are contemporary activists in my book who, and, and oh my God, on this book tour, so far I've been out for a week and I've heard from so many women who are breaking up, ending relationships. The, a woman in eyesight in my book who's very involved in the teacher activism in Arizona says five of her friends are getting divorced. Um, and again, it's like the politicization that has come means changing of rules and changing of roles in some very intimate relationships. And that is hard. And, um, it's, and it's why these kinds of movements coalesce around gender inequity 
very rarely. One of the things that has been, well, I don't want to say interesting to watch because that sounds so academic, just sort of, sort of um, hard to bear is that the more we as women rise up and men rise up on behalf of women, the more men who want to retain control and power push back. And I think, we, I think that the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, which are so top of mind right now, are an excellent example of that at work. Not just Kavanaugh himself and his behavior, but you know, m most of the people that confirmed him. So how, how, is that, how is that a good thing? <laughs> you know, we're pushing hard, and they're pushing back harder. Well, if there weren't the power and equity to begin with, if we could solve this without tremendous, powerful, destructive, punitive pushback, we probably would have solved it a long time ago. The whole point and the whole thing that we're straining against is um, power, enormous amounts of power held by a minority. One of the things that I write about in this book that I think people are talking about more and more is the fact that this country, which we you know, flatter ourselves as a kind of representative democracy, is in fact a country that has been governed from its start by a minority. And it was built on minority rule, right? The founders who were so furious, and we do recognize their fury as righteous and patriotic. It's the kind of political anger that we revere in this country is the anger of the founders that led to the rupture with England. It was revolutionary, and out of it was birthed this new country. And what those founders did is they made their new country was codify a whole set of inequities that completely echoed the lack of representation that they were so angry about with regard to their governance by England. So they built a country in which an entire population was enslaved, in which an entire half of the population was denied the franchise and denied legal, professional, public, economic, um, opportunity for full civic participation. And on the labor of that enslaved population and on the unpaid, unfully recognized, and unenfranchised population, those founders who were white men built our courts, our businesses, our economy on the labor of the people who did not have representation within the government. That is minority rule. And we're seeing, and, and the mechanisms that they put in place from the Electoral College to the way that they designed the Senate, all of that was designed to strengthen, enforce, and protect the power of that minority over a fundamentally subjugated and oppressed majority population. And, and they had a choice back then, right? I mean, they could have made the laws differently. We have, you have a quote at the beginning of your book from Abigail Adams. Right, there Which were- Which is fantastic. <laughs> Could you read that? <laughs> I, I can, I can. It's at the beginning. So here's the thing about Abigail Adams. You probably, yeah. if you know something that Abigail Adams said, it is probably one line. Does any, can anybody shout it out? Remember the ladies, okay? Now, I want to ask you something. Can you think of a lower bar? <laughs> this is like, I grew up sort of with this sense of like Abigail Adams really pushed back and like in a sort of hazy mid-Atlantic accent over PBS documentaries, there would be like, Abigail Adams objected. Remember the ladies, John? And you're like, really? Just remember that they exist. But here's the thing, and this is part of, when I look back at the history, it's A, finding the women and then excavating their anger, which has been like totally conveniently obscured. Because here's what Abigail Adams wrote in that same Remember the Ladies letter. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. So, so consider what it means that that part is not read in the PBS documentaries. <laughs> Well, that, I mean, that is one of the wonderful things 
one of the many wonderful things about your book is that you do bring up these women throughout history who, who are under, either not recognized at all, misrepresented, <laughs> or, or un, under-recognized, and certainly not taught in schools. I mean, I, I, go, I go to back to school night, and I hear what the teachers are teaching, and some of them are going completely off the, the standard curriculum and teaching all about amazing women throughout history. But it's, it's rare. It's really not happening. And, um, and you bring up a lot of these women, women who are cha have made change throughout time, and that's what gives me hope. But it also makes me wonder, what's taking so long? Right. Well, and there are women, as I said, there's this double process. You have to go back and find the women. For example, do, how many of you have ever heard of a woman who was named Mumbet or Elizabeth Freeman? Any of you ever heard of this woman? A couple, a couple hands. So one of the points that I make, I talk about how that revolutionary anger is really fetishized in this country. We, we love the founders, right? Um, they're on a mountain. <laughs> yeah. They're like in our buildings and we visit their bells and everything. So, <laughs> but so much of the fury and the politicized fury that has in fact been expressed by members of that, you know, subjugated majority population actually takes pains to mimic the rhetoric um, of their founding rupture from England, right? To say, okay, wait, this, this is righteous, what they said, so I'm gonna apply it to my circumstance. And there are all kinds of examples in the book of this, including, you know, obviously, Seneca Falls, the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848 is a riff on the Declaration of Independence. Um, the Lowell Mill workers, the young women who staged some of the first iteration of the women's movement, of the, of the labor movement, when they went on some of the very first walkouts and formed a union, in the 1830s, we always hear about the labor, the history of the labor movement in large part as a male movement, white male, coal miners, um, teamsters, but it was women who had really a catalytic role and the, the Lowell Mill strikers also used the language as our forefathers resisted the bloody avarice of the British government, they called on that rhetoric too. But Mum Bet is, a, is an especially interesting case. She is working, she's an enslaved woman in the home of a man engaged in revolutionary era politics. And she's badly abused in this home. The, the wife hits her with a hot kitchen implement. And she hears this rhetoric and the political argument of, of the American Revolution in her home. And she applies the arguments to her own condition and petitions for her freedom. And she wins her case. And the case goes on to be one of the legal underpinnings for what becomes the, the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts in 1783. So, but none of us have ever heard of Mumbet. And I think that this is, and, and, and this is what part of the project is, is finding the women. And then in the cases of the women that we have heard of, I was taught in school about Rosa Parks. And what I was taught about Rosa Parks was that she was extremely tired which I have no doubt that she was. <laughs> that she was very stoic. I was taught, and this is so strange to me, I was taught and knew in my bones from the time I was in second grade or whatever, that she was a seamstress, right? Does everybody hear, everybody heard that Rosa Parks was a seamstress? Here's what I was never taught about Rosa Parks. That she was a lifelong, furious activist against racial violence, and racial injustice. She was an investigator for the NAACP who investigated the gang rape of black women in the Jim Crow South by white men and claims made by white women of sexual incursions by black men. She wrote about and talked about anger at, at racism that she felt from the time that she was a girl. She was trained in political activism and civil disobedience. Her decision to keep her seat on the bus that day was not born simply of being tired. It was a political act. She knew what she was doing. She was doing it intentionally. And her compatriots in that movement understood that. And there was, in, in recent years, there's a terrific book by Danielle McGuire that was published a few years ago called At the Dark End of the Street that really excavated this history of Rosa Parks and it became more popularly understood in recent years. But at the time, during the Civil Rights Movement, many of the women in that movement, Gloria Richardson, Anna Ardell Hedgeman, Polly Murray, Dorothy Height, they were angry about the way that Rosa Parks' story had been minimized and sanitized. 
This was an anger that existed within a civil rights movement at, in real time. And yet her story was still repeatedly presented as one of, not of anger, not of righteous fury, but of quiet, prim, proper stoicism, of, of solicitousness, the nonviolence, and of course, much of the civil rights movement was built on nonviolent protest, but that was the thing that was heralded and could, be, and could be digestible and palatable to an American public. And we have to think about why that is. Well, I mean, and why that is, is what are the things that we are all taught as young girls? To smile, to stay calm when things are, get hard, to, um, you know, not let, blow things off if it seems like maybe someone did something against you, just let it go. Because we understand that the only way we're gonna be heard or taken seriously is if we present ourselves within a very na narrow range of expressive um, possibility, which is why when a woman sat in front of a Senate Judiciary Committee 10 days ago, a week ago, two weeks ago, she was so solicitous that she kept asking if she was doing everything right and kept saying, I want to be collegial. And I want to be helpful. I want to be helpful. I want to be collegial. And that she didn't raise her voice and that she was polite and deferential, because if she had raised her voice and if she had expressed any of the anger that she had every reason to feel, she would have been heard as unreliable, as vindictive, um, as crazy and unstable. And I, I believe she even commented, I can't remember if it was during the hearings or in a statement, that that's how she was raised. That she was, she was taught to be like that. Right. It's a message that all of us absorb. Um, in the book, I, I had a wonderful interview with Barbara Lee, who may represent many of the people in this room. <laughs> she is, for the record, my favorite politician in Washington. Um, <laughs> and it's now officially on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she tells this incredible story about... As many of you probably know, she was the only member of Congress in 2001 to vote against the authorization of the use of military force. She has spent 16 years working to repeal the AUMF, which of course has been used to justify military invasions without congressional approval. Um, I can't remember in how many, you know, 30-something instances. Um, she's worked and worked and worked on it. And in 2017, last summer, she got bipartisan support for the repeal. It was like the only functional thing that's happened in years in Washington. People, it was actually such a surprise that people clapped. In the, the Congress clapped for itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she got support, not only from fellow Democrats, but from Republicans to put this repeal in, I believe, an appropriations bill. And it was just, it was kind of joyful. And in the middle of the night, the next week, Paul Ryan took the repeal out. He stripped it from the bill in the middle of the night. And Barbara Lee tells me the story of going to have the official conversation with her colleague Pete Sessions about why this had happened and to voice her objection to the fact that this portion of the bill had been stripped for no reason, with no justification. And she talks about the internal calculations and, and work that she was doing to not appear angry, knowing, as she says, that she would just be heard as the angry black woman and that it would work against her and that she had to keep her voice in check and she had to be friendly and she had to be light in tone or that it would hurt her case and she would be written off. And about how hard it was to maintain that control in a situation where she had every right and every reason to be livid. And then she writes about how after she does this, and she does, she's polite, she's direct, um, she betrays almost no anger and even and very little irritation. How many of her white peers congratulated her on holding it together and how that made her even angrier. <laughs> we are all fed the messages about what tones are going to disqualify us and marginalize us. And it's one of the things, if I can, I mean, I hope that we can all tune our ears to the ways in which, I, I, somebody actually said to me in an interview today, a man was talking about how, well, this woman doesn't seem angry, 
And I was like, distrust your conviction that a woman who doesn't sound angry isn't angry. Think about that for a minute. Rebecca, when and how did you get comfortable expressing your anger? Um, well, you know... And actually, before you even answer the question, let me tell you a very short anecdote to all of you. When I told a friend of mine that I would be speaking with you, she said, oh, Rebecca Tracer is the best. Every time I see her on TV, there's fire coming out of her nose. <laughs> So anyway, how did you get to there? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think there was a point there when I wrote for Salon and began to write about feminism, which was, you know, 14, 14 years ago. Um, it was at a period where there had been decades of a kind of anti-feminist um, deep freeze, backlash deep freeze, where there hadn't been a huge amount of feminist journalism in mainstream media for anybody who's now grown up in a world where there is actually a feminist media and like feminist journalist is a profession like this will sound very unfamiliar but um, there were a bunch of people who sort of in the same years started writing about the news and pop culture from a feminist perspective and I was among them and there was many of us I think took great pains either consciously or just instinctively to um, obscure whatever anger might have undergirded our work and if you're writing about gender to inequality and racial inequality and economic inequality, of course anger is to some extent um, a foundation of why you do what you do. But I, I was among those who took pains to be like funny and um, easygoing in my tone and, and light. And it, by the way, it didn't matter. I still got all kinds of hate mail. Um, <laughs> bright star. Um, I got all kinds of Mail saying, you know, reader mail saying, you're just angry and you're bitter because no man wants you. There was all kinds of the, you know, the, the aspersions were just right there um, at hand. But I think that a lot of the, a lot of the women and, and some, the few men who were, who were writing about um, these things from a feminist perspective in those years were taking great pains after the bitter backlash toward second wave feminism that characterized everybody as angry, screaming, man-hating, sexless, humorless harridans to like prove that that's not what this new generation of feminism was. Um, and that meant making sure that nothing sounded too angry. Um, and so, it, it, you know, even though everybody just called us angry anyway, as if that insult was sort of self-contained, you sound angry. That was the number one way to make somebody feel bad. So it was later in my career um, that there was actually a day. There was actually a day when I was so fucking pissed about a number of things, including a lot of things that I was reading about in the news and my own professional situation. This was at a later job, and I just wrote a, a column out of pure acidic anger, and I didn't take any pains to make it prettier. I was just livid, and I submitted it. And much to my surprise, my editor at the time at the New Republic was like, this is great, and just published it. And I just sort of, I just didn't care. And it, it, that, that piece happened to go viral, and it was a tremendous lesson to me about the communicative power of anger. That it didn't, it wasn't just something that necessarily pushed people away or that was divisive. It could also, um, voicing anger could be meaningful to people who were feeling it, but maybe hadn't said it themselves or hadn't heard it from somebody else, and that it could create connection. Um, I think within a political and an organizing context, that's also really important because I think that anger makes women audible to each other. And one of the strategies behind suppressing women's anger is to keep them in isolation and not from comparing notes about everything that pisses them off, and then per perhaps working in cooperation and coalition to organize to change the things that piss them off. So after that column, that's the turning point that I can think of. It was the first time I remember just sort of letting loose with absolute raw fury. And that's not something I try to replicate because I do know um, that there are costs. And this is something I want to say about my own ability to go on TV. I, I can be angry on TV now, but I'm in an extraordinarily unusual position. And I want to be really clear that nothing that I'm writing in this book is suggesting to other women just go out and rage, right? If you want to and you have comfort and, and feel safe voicing your anger, then that's, I encourage it. But 
part of the book is about the very real tolls and risks and censure that women who are angry still face if they express it, right? It would have backfired on Christine Blasey Ford if she'd gone on in there and yelled. It can, you may be angry because of the way that you're treated at work and have every reason to be angry, but if you go in and express that anger, you risk getting fired, you risk not getting a promotion, you risk getting a reputation as difficult or crazy in a way that, that is gonna imperil you economically and professionally. If you are a woman of color who is pulled over or questioned about something that is ridiculous, you have every reason in the world to be livid, but if you express that anger, that puts you at risk of not only arrest, incarceration, but, but injury and death. There are real tolls out there imposed on women who are willing to unapologetically express their rage. And I would never recommend to women that the, that the I would never suggest that the thing we have to do is further alter our behavior and be mad in different ways or be mad in louder ways and, and find ways to work within a system that fundamentally doesn't make room for or wanna hear about our anger. The thing that, the degree to which I have any kind of prescription for what to do going forward isn't about expressing our own anger, it's about changing the way we listen to and hear the anger of other women. Because that's the only way that we can begin to alter the reception that women's anger gets. And it's about being curious about why other women are angry. So many, other, so many of the women I interviewed for this book said to me, you're the first person who's ever asked me why I'm angry. We have to start asking the women around us who are angry, understanding that for many of us, especially white women and privileged women, some of the anger that we may be asking about is gonna be directed toward us. And we need to listen and think about the validity and the, and the political implications of what other women's anger may be. We need to respect it more and treat it the way we treat white men's anger, which is as fundamentally diagnostic. There's a study that I cite in the book that says when people look at pictures of angry people, they look at the pictures of angry women and assume that those women are just angry all the time. And I mean, that, that, that they're just bitches. And they look at pictures of men who have anger on their face and they assume that something bad happened in that man's day. So that the anger of men is understood to be pointing you towards something that needs to be fixed. Whereas anger, the anger of women suggests that it's the women themselves that need to be fixed. And we need to change that. We need to start treating women's anger as, as an expression that can direct us toward something that's wrong. What does is, what is this woman's anger tell us about what's wrong with the world? And how do we take seriously the thing that's making her angry? And so for me, the directive is less about how we all figure out how to express our anger differently and more about how we figure out how to hear women's anger differently. We, we are gonna take questions from anyone who would like to come up and ask a question. We've got quite a bit of time set aside for that. So if you have, not, not at this moment, I'm gonna ask one more question and then there's actually a microphone over here. So. As I ask my last question, for those of you who are interested, I think our setup, Jody, is that right? We're gonna be um, directing people over here. So you can think about your questions and head that direction. So, so on that note, you have, you talk about Andrea Dworkin in the book and how she was just considered this crazy angry feminist who like no one would listen to because she was so off the rails. And then you talk about how you tweeted a quote from her and you got, Lots and lots of hearts. <laughs> right, right. Can you, can you, do you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you remember exactly what, what that quote was? I don't remember okay. exactly what the quote was. Well, I, when I went back and read Andrea Dworkin, who, you know, for somebody, right. <laughs> yeah, explain who Andrea Dworkin is. Andrea Dworkin was a, a radical feminist. One of the people who's written about her, Arielle Levy, has described her as, and, you know, I have all this cited in the book, and I hope I'm getting it right, you know, as this, uh, the sort of pop, pop culture and politics nightmare of the angriest woman in the world. She was unapologetically angry about um, inequality within heterosexual relationships. And, and in fact, when I was coming up, some of those comments, the, the angry comments that I would get when I was writing for Salon, even comparatively mildly about feminism, where people would tell me you know, that I just needed to get laid, I was often referred to as a dorkinist, like that was the worst thing you could say 
about a young feminist was that she was a dwarfist. And I actually grew up, you know, as a young woman, I grew up feeling quite a bit of distance from Andrea Dwork. And I did disagree with her about her, she had a crusade against pornography. Um, and I disagree with her about sex work. But when I went back, especially in the months after Me Too, or after the height of Me Too, and read so much of her writing about the power abuses within heterosexual dynamics, it made me so sad. Um, she died, I think, in 2005. Um, it made me so sad because so much of what she was writing about was so prescient, not only about the conversations we have been having over the past couple of years, but also in terms of her tone, that tone that got her ostracized as being too angry, too radical, too difficult to be appreciated in her lifetime, is a tone that you can find every day on Twitter now, right? <laughs> and um, she, one of the most moving things, I wish I could find this reference, it was the, it's, Okay, there's my, my colleague and friend, Erin Carmone, um, who did some of the reporting and writing about Charlie Rose for the Washington Post. She's a feminist journalist, and she, she investigated and was part of a writing team that published the stories about Charlie Rose and his kind of serial um, sexual harassment and, and assault of, I think in the end, more than 30 women made claims against him. And she's younger than I am, and she recalled, she at some point mentioned to me that she'd interviewed Andrea Dworkin before she died, when, when Erin herself had been a freshman in college. And I went back and I read Erin's interview with Andrea Dworkin, and it like, it gutted me. Because Erin, as a young feminist and a freshman at college, had been very confused about why some of her peers weren't angrier about the sexism that seemed very obvious to her as an 18-year-old. And then Andrea Dworkin came to, co to college, and she asked Andrea Dworkin, what do you do about people who aren't as upset? Do you have it? I don't, I don't know if that's exactly right. I don't, I don't yeah. know if I have the right section, but I'm close. Erin, young 18-year-old Erin, says, how do you save people who don't think very much is wrong? And this was what... Andrea Dworkin said in response, that's where first person testimony of women has been so important. Because the mainstream will say, oh, that doesn't happen. And then a group of women will say, well, it happened to me. And I read that and I was like, my God. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was, it's, it's prophetic. Um, and it made me very sad that she died before an era, and I don't know that she would have approved <laughs> of, of how all this is unfolding, but she died before an era in which I think her work, or at least some of her work, might be much better appreciated. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So do folks have questions? Uh, Vicki is standing here with a microphone in her hand, and if you do have questions, please approach the mic. It looks like we have someone here. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious about Susan Collins and the Kavanaugh hearings because amidst all of my anger, I found that most of my anger was reserved towards her because of her statement and what I felt like was gaslighting, but I'm also wondering if I'm being like, this is all by design. They want me to hate the woman who voted for him, not the system in general. And uh, I just found my own thoughts about that really hard to unpack. It, it's, all, it's all pretty hard to unpack. I mean, I think her statement was particularly odious and um, that the particular anger you feel about it is not inappropriate um, because it was repulsive. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, one of the things I write, a lot of the book is about sort of righteous and progressive um, movements that have, in which women's anger has been catalytic, but I don't want to suggest that all women's anger in a political context is progressive by any means, because um, there have always been women who will be rewarded within a white patriarchy for defending that white patriarchy. In fact, there are some of the greatest rewards on offer um, to the women who are willing to do the work of further bolstering, supporting, and defending 
white patriarchal power, and those women are most often white women. And white women have been at the forefront. There's this great recent book about white women um, as the, the frontline fighters against school integration in the middle of the 20th century. Um, it's Phyllis Schlafly led an army of white women, angry white women, who were angry on, in response to the power disruptions of second wave feminism, and who in their anger and rush to defend white patriarchy actually succeeded in, in halting the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1982. White women, as we know, uh, not only did 53% of them vote for Donald Trump, 53% of us, I can't have to stop saying them, um, white women have voted for Republicans in every election since 1952, except for 1992 when they voted, when a majority of them voted for Bill Clinton, who also left the campaign trail partway through to execute Ricky Ray Rector, a black man in Arkansas. And in 1996, when some of them voted for Ross Perot, and therefore a majority didn't vote for a Republican. Those are the only two exceptions since 1952. 56% of white women voted for Mitt Romney over Barack Obama in 2012. Um, so, I don't mean to suggest in my book on women's anger that it is all on the side of progressivism. What I, what I do mean to argue is that it is very often potent, right? And the thing that Susan Collins was doing was supporting the further accumulation um, of, of white patriarchal power, cementing that minority rule. And she will be rewarded for it. She already has been. She was like on six Sunday shows. Nobody's ever been as interested in talking to Susan Collins as they were this weekend. She will, and uh, you know, my brother texted me this morning <laughs> saying, Susan Collins is going to be the new ambassador to the UN. Um, and, you know... I, uh, he was joking. He's joking. That's not a, that's not a fact. Checking. It was just he was guessing. He was guessing at what is the reward going to be, and there will be one. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you know, you're, we have to acknowledge that... The, the person who's done some of the thinking about this that has been most instructive to me is a woman named Brittany Cooper, who is a gender studies professor at Rutgers and wrote an incredibly beautiful, just unbelievably great book about women's anger, about black feminist rage called Eloquent Rage. It was published in February. And she is the person who has really helped me understand within a white patriarchy the way that advantages and incentives get extended to members of that subjugated majority in a way that works to separate it from itself, to divide the majority against itself. And, you know, what, what she says is that the, the advantages of patriarchy are extended to men across races. So that men get to enjoy patriarchal po power within their relationships and within their families and at their workplaces. And that white supremacy is the advantage an incentive extended to white women, and that they get to enjoy the benefits and profit from white supremacy thanks to their proximity to white men and to their own whiteness. And, you know, part of what she argues that I think is crucial is that because neither of these um, you know, sets of advantages are offered to women of color, it's part of what's enabled women of color to be the groundbreaking thinkers and organizers behind so many of the social movements from which they are then erased. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> is that a wireless mic or does that have a wire on it? Okay, you have to come to the front if you have a question. You gotta go over there. It's good, stand up, exercise your legs a little, get your brain flowing. We, have, we probably have time for a couple. If, if you keep answering at that length, we have time for like two more questions. I'm sorry. I'm going to start giving yes and no answers. <laughs> so I have um, a request for um, ideas as well as a question. Um, my, my question, first of all, is can we really separate patriarchy and white patriarchy from a system, a capitalist system? And my second is, how can we take this majority white and privileged audience here tonight and use our power for the good of our communities, especially before November 8th, before we vote? 
Thank you, Elka. <laughs> so, so I do get to do a yes or no answer to your first question, which is, can we separate white patriarchy from capitalism? No. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that one of my goals in writing this book was specifically to address some of the newly enraged women in this country. Now, there may be people in this room, there may be a lot of people who have been angry for your entire lives and who have been doing activism and politically engaged for your entire lives, right? So not all white women, not all white people, whatever hashtag you want to append to this. However, um, I, as a white feminist, TM, I am <laughs> excruciatingly aware of the dynamics of race within women's movements, of the fact that um, women of color in, in many cases have been out on the front lines, never apathetic, <laughs> never not being angry or, or um, working toward organizing and changing this country, and that there is a pattern in this country in which relatively privileged white women become angry in moments where it's, it boils over and, and the injustices become visible and sort of undeniable, and then come into movements, which is good, I, I am on the side of this is good, this is correct, in fact, we should be angry all the time, um, and either appropriate or eclipse or assume that they are the, the leaders um, within these movements. And, um, and a lot of this book is, is written with an eye toward um, trying to get some context for those dynamics and trying to look at the history of white supremacy within these movements, and also to think about what it means to ask white women to participate, but not to be the only ones talking, and to do the listening that I was talking about before. And that a lot of what is, I think, we are compelled to do as, as white, pr comparatively privileged people is to um, look to the leadership and work that's already, and the groundwork that's already been done by those who have been engaged for a lot longer than we have. Yeah. <laughs> I could sense applause coming. I didn't want to step on it. <laughs> so actually, there's a great, um, we, I see we have one more question, but I wanted to just comment that you tell a great story in the book of someone in St. Louis who wanted to protest the immigration ban and who reached out to Jessica Morales, who I think runs the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and asked her, how, how do I protest? Right? She got a direct message on, on Twitter, said, how do I do it? And Jessica wrote back, you get your friends, you get a car, you get some signs, right? You show up and you, you sing don't some leave songs. When they tell you yes, to. Yeah. <laughs> right, and you have a protest. Right, a lot of this is about learning, um, and especially for the people who are new to this kind of engagement, it's about acknowledging that we're learning and listening to the people who have a lot to teach. And letting, not only listening, but, but letting those people lead. Next question. Hi. Um, I was listening to what you had to say about how from a very early age, we're sort of programmed to be quiet and be in control and hold it together. And I have a nine-year-old daughter. Um, and I see that happening to her already. Um, in her school and just in the world. Um, and I, I find myself struggling with not, not knowing how to help her because I feel like the, the deck is sort of stacked against her. And so I just, I don't know, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on raising girls to be okay with expressing their anger and, and figuring out how to make it safe for them. Um, thank you for that question. I also, I have two daughters at home. I am um, notoriously bad at parenting advice. <laughs> um, my elder daughter, um, you know, is very politically engaged and like insisted on staying up to watch the um, Cynthia Nixon, Andrew Cuomo debate, but also um, is, uh, you know, paralyzed by anxiety at various points. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Um, so I'm very bad at parenting advice, and I find myself, just so you know, and I've thought about it a lot in the past year or so, I find myself saying things like, don't yell at me about the, the chewing gum, 
Like, stop yelling. And then I'm like, well, what am I, what am I communicating? Am I also repeating and, and contributing to some of these messages? And then there's part of me that's like, but it really isn't worth yelling about the chewing gum. Um, but again, the thing that I would say is that, um, and something that I've thought about, and I actually regret a line in my, my acknowledgments, because in my acknowledgments, I write something about, I dedicated this book to my kids in part because I want you to know, you know, that it's okay to be angry. It can be correct to be angry. And, and that is something that I want young girls to know. But I wish that I had also added this thing that I said earlier, which is, I want you to care about other people's anger. And that that's part of it too. Um, and, and that that's especially true for me as a white mother of white girls. Um, it's not just about I want you to go out and express your anger. It's I want you to care about the anger of the people around you and your friends and your compatriots. And I want you to express your anger to each other and, and learn to value it in each other and work together. And that's the only thing I can tell you about what I, I am now working to try to teach my kids. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your work and for this incredibly important conversation about anger. Um, and I'm wondering to go back to the Kavanaugh hearings. So it seems as though he was coached, that he was too kind of quiet and you know, didn't have enough affect in his interview on television. So his boss, our president, kind of said, show your anger you know, in the hearings, and he did. And there was a moment where maybe that was going to work against him, but in the end, it sort of worked in his favor. And meanwhile, Christine Blasey Ford was, you know, so, so moderate and deferential, as we've said. Um, and I, you know, myself watching that, I felt like, you know, or, you know good for her. She's, she's like staying calm. We have to do that. But it didn't end up obviously working in her favor. She was mocked and humiliated by our president. The vote went against her. She can't you know, move back to her own home. So I'm, I, I'm wondering, I realize that women are not allowed to express anger in the way that men are. But on the other hand, is there a, you know, in another counterfactual universe where Christine Blasey Ford stands up and says, you know, this happened to me. It's, you know, it's affected my life permanently and I'm outraged. You know, what does that look like? You know, what, wh how much worse could that be, I guess I'm wondering. How much time till we get there? Because <laughs> in like 20 years, the whole planet's going to melt down. So, <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of what it looks like, I think we can only barely imagine what it looks like. I mean, I, I, what I imagine it, look like, it looking like if Christine Blasey Ford had come in there and raged, righteous, no matter how righteously, I mean, somebody said to me, like, they would have called the cops, you know? It would have been so outside the bounds of um, what was acceptable from a woman. I think that, you know, the, you can imagine all the things that would have... She was playing the victim. She was performing rage. She was um, being theatrical. I mean, I, I would also encourage you to look at the way that those senators talked about the protesters long before, in the weeks weeks before the assault allegations had been made public when there were protesters protesting the, the nomination, yelling about the repeal of health care and about the prospective repeal of, of Roe v. Wade. And there were really tremendously admirable women in that gallery just shouting, holding up signs, being taken out, arrested, and then another one would get up and shout and hold up signs. And the, the language that was used by the Republican members of the judiciary, Orrin Hatch said, get that loud mouth out of here. We shouldn't have to put up with this. And Ben Sass gave a whole oratory on how for decades he's been hearing women yelling about how women are going to die if abortion is illegal. And this is a really, and he used the word hysteria, right? So if that's the language, loud mouth hysterics, that was being deployed against the protesters, we can only imagine the way that Christine Blasey Ford would have been written off by the members of the judiciary who it, she had to make the impression upon, right? But there is this other model that came out of those same days for a model of women 
unapologetically expressing their fury. And it was the protesters and it was the women who confronted Jeff Flake in the elevator, Anna Maria Archila and Maria Gallagher. And, and their anger was also supposed to make an impression on Jeff Flake, which it may have, even though the thing that he called for was a total sham. Um, but it was, there was something so powerful about seeing and hearing those women with their voices shaking, screaming, pointing their fingers at this powerful man. And the part of the demand that they were making was, meet me in the eye, look at me in the eye. We are demanding that you listen to us and that you see us and that you don't pretend that our anger doesn't exist. And that anger, which Christine Blasey Ford could never have voiced anything like that given the context in which she was speaking, if she, if she hoped to be taken seriously and not hauled off by authorities. But those women's anger was deployed in a way that I think is powerful and again communicative and connective to masses of women who felt like those women were, were speaking for them and confronting someone in power and forcing that person in power to look and to listen and to respond. And I think that's a model moving forward that we should remember. I, I bet that decades from now, that elevator confrontation will be cited as having been catalytic and communicatively crucial to the building and what, what I hope will become the coalition building that will continue and will need to continue because we are looking at the rest of our lives. Everyone in this room, this is not something that's gonna be fixed in four weeks. This is not something that's gonna be fixed in 2020 or 2024. This is now the rest of our lives. And we have to figure out how to take the anger that we are feeling and use it to change the country. And there are, there are centuries, generations of people who have come before us who have had the same project ahead of them and who have given their lives to trying to make this country better. And we, rather than be depressed by this, I am inspired <laughs> by the idea that there were people in the past who devoted their lives to this, and now it's our turn. But that is what we're looking at. give you a standing ovation. I don't know if anyone else wants to stand up for a second, but that is awesome.